Hello to you once again. For those of you out there who have viewed my videos involving unusual openings such as the Spike and Danish Gambit and Dunst, then you might well be interested in this one. I think there's a lot to be learnt from irregular openings and they are, like I've already made clear on other videos, possibly of use in speed chess where you're likely to trip up the opponent. After all, that is the meaning of the Italian word gambit, trip up. So, what we're going to do in this game, it's not a long game, it finished in the mid-twenties of moves, and I was black, and I thought I'd try out something that I'd been playing around with for a, a little while and, and see what I could do with it. There are other moves, of course, in the lines as we go along. I'll just mention them in passing and I'll leave it up to you to, to look further into it if you want to. But this main line, it, it hits the mark as far as the general idea is concerned of what I'm trying to do here for black. So let's just take a look at this. It opens with e4, e5, f4. Nothing new in this so far. It is the king's gambit. Can you see what I'm going to play next that I don't believe has ever been tried before? Well, it's this. And of course at this stage you could play takes here or push on Queen H5, Knight F3. Knight F3 transposes into a main line either Kizaritsky or Algar Gambit of the King's Gambit. But we're not interested in the King's Gambit here, really. Only the fact that we started with it. We don't want to carry on with it. I've named this the Kinko Gambit. It's a combination of the King's Gambit and the Benko Gambit. And so we arrive at the counterpart to the Benko Gambit like this. And White takes off, like that. Like in the Benko Gambit, we take with the bishop here. Now, of course, what is quite different here is that we're on the other side of the board. We're not, like with the Benko Gambit, an offshoot of the Benoni defense for black. We're not homing down like that. We're homing down here. Although, as this game moves along, you'll see that there are similarities to the Benko Gambit, I'm quite sure. So, what is the best move here for white? He didn't play my opponent in, the, in this 30 minutes game. He did not play the best move, in my opinion. Well, play here, and then the best reply is this, we're opening lines. And I'd say in spite of Black being a pawn down, he has a lot of play coming along, especially along these open lines. What I'd say also, is that this is worthy of consideration. Now, I won't say too much about this because it will give away what's coming along. They're both lines for anyone out there who wants to, to analyze them. What I would say though is, don't think that there's no difference between d3 and d4, because if you play d4, then I'm afraid to have to say that this is more or less winning for black at once, because if you look at that, and he plays g3, you take here. Which, of course, with d3 you're not able to do because he, he'd capture your queen. And if he moves the king, you can still take the pawn, and it's a displaced king position, and there are real problems there. So, you don't really want to go in for that. You avoid that nicely with d3, but not with d4. So, what move did my opponent play? Well, he played knight f3. Now, What's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is, although he's attacking that e-pawn, I found a unique way of defending it. I'd already found this in pre-game analysis, and so I had the upper hand yet again on my opponent. And what we're doing here is we're protecting this pawn, but also homing in on this. I realize it's doubly protected at the moment, but if, if you look at this position, black is already in trouble. White is already in trouble. 
is he not? Why is he in trouble there? Because this is the threat on the next move. Check. He can't afford to take it because the rook would go and therefore he has to move his king. So in this position he has to reckon with check or move his king either way he's going to have to move that king at some point. If he plays g3 now of course you just whip the pawn off and the pawn is pinned and if he takes the bishop the rook goes so that's no good. So what can he play here? He's in a, a spot of bother. What he plays is this, and he's thinking, well, now you're going to have to take my bishop, aren't you? Well, no, like I've just said, we play bishop g3. And he realizes that, of course, now he has to move his king. Where does he play it? Well, he has a choice. He chose this one. I don't really think that it makes that much difference. The fact is we've managed to displace White's king, stop him from castling, and he's in a, a bit of a state of disarray there. So how do we respond to that? Well, we can leave the bishop where it is. It, it's not threatened at all, because should he take it, the rook goes. So what I did is I developed in the center. And of course, you're as good as saying is, if you take here, I'll push on hitting the knight. And if you take here, I'll take here hitting the knight. So what did he do? Well, he took this way. D takes E5. So I played D takes E4. Hitting the knight. Now you see, he can't really afford to move that knight because if he did, we have bishop G4 winning the queen. So he's in a spot of bother there, isn't he? So what he does, of course, is he takes the queen. And I take back. Now black of course can't castle, but he's not really interested in castling. He's interested in throwing an all-out assault on his opponent. So what does white do here? Well, his knight is all prees. And of course, should he move at bishop g4 with these bishops? It looks very threatening. What he does is he plays, he's playing for time check. So how did I handle that? Right, well, you just go back to e8, and his knight is still all prees. So what does he do? Well, he plays it here, and what he's doing here is eyeing over, going to here, and trying to fork king and rook. So what happens now? Well, a most surprising turn of events happens now. Congrats to any of you who've seen it. We play rook takes h2. Because, of course, now his knight is no longer covering h2, is it? So what does he play? Well, he's no option but to take back. He must. And by implication, we take back. And just take a, a look at that position. We are even in material. What can white do here? What can he do? This pawn is threatened. Don't forget. Well, what he plays is this. And of course, take off, he takes off. So he's temporarily saved his pawn, but not for long, because now the bishop homes in on both the pawn on f6 and the knight on d4. He really only has one realistic move here, and that is what he intended to do originally, knight b5 threatening to go to c7. So do we move the king? No, what we do is we take this pawn. So as things stand, white is now pawned down. 
and he cannot save this rook. So quite clearly his only rejoinder is to take here with check, hopefully winning black's rook. So black goes to here, his rook comes off. And so does white's. So we just pause for a moment and have a look at that position. At the moment, material is equal. Um, White's knight is clearly trapped. So what White decides to do is to attempt to trap Black's bishop with c3. I suppose you could play bishop takes c3 here, but I think the line of play that I adopted in the game is preferable. And so what happened was we played bishop f5. We're covering this pawn and we're also planning on getting the knight to d7 with the idea of taking that pawn on f6. We're also threatening to push this and win the knight. And of course, should the knight move, you play bishop takes c3. So that works out quite nicely as well. So what does he play there? Well, he blocks the pawn march on with king e3. He's blockading it. So now, like I said, we play here heading for the f6 pawn. So he has this idea that he plays bishop c4. What he's wanting to do is to come to d5 and get his knight out from a8. Does he succeed? Well, no, he doesn't. Why doesn't he succeed? Just have a look at that position. Because you play here, first of all, covering this pawn and you're also still covering this. So he plays here. What now? Black plays king c8, stopping bishop b7. And now white really is left without a decent move. What he in fact played in the game is he took this off, I took back and he took. Then I took this pawn here. Now then, what choice does white have here? He's losing this knight. Okay, for the moment he's stopping this, but he's not really because it is going to get out. So no matter where he moves with that king now onto the fifth rank, whether it's here or here, it makes no difference. Can you see the winning move? Yes, knight e8. And what you do with the knight on the pawn, you stop the king making any further progress. He effectively has to go all the way around, and in that amount of time you can win the knight, and you can get your bishop. He has to move this knight if he wants it to be in play. And at that point, white lost on time. He admitted, and this is becoming a regular thing, that he was in a lost position, and he is. That is a very interesting line of play, and again, in these short timescale scale games, I think it might be worth giving it a go. If you are faced with a king's gambit, try it out and see what happens. And all the best to you in your chess. Goodbye for now.